You're listening to Tales of the Revolution with Jason Vreeke. Storytelling with a purpose, encountering the real Jesus of Nazareth. Subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, or anywhere podcasts are found. Learn more at talesoftherevolution.com. On social media, find us at facebook.com slash talesoftherevolution. Twitter, at Jason Vreeke. Instagram, at real Jason Vreeke. That's V as in victory. R-E-E-K-E. Now, onto the show. I'm calling this episode, Damaged Goods. For the record, I don't think either of my guest storytellers are damaged goods. But sometimes we feel that way. And I'm here to tell you it is not true. What happened yesterday doesn't have to happen every day. And tomorrow, it's all new. It's yours if you want it but you need to stick with the one who controls tomorrow, the greatest revolutionary of all, Jesus of Nazareth. He is the one who makes all things new. Just surrender your life to him. I met Jerry over 10 years ago when we first worked in radio together at the same station. At first, I pegged him as your standard radio veteran, maybe because of his clean look or smooth vocal stylings but you should never judge a book by its cover or a man by his outward appearance. I was all wrong about Jerry. There's so much more to his story, so much depth. And here is a case in point as to why I find it so important to share our stories. It's a lot tougher to judge somebody when you know their story, when you know from where they have come. My first guest storyteller is Jerry Langford, morning host of KSDW Radio in San Diego, California. Listen now to his tale of the revolution. When Christians in church ask, who do you identify with the most in the Bible? Some will point to Peter because of foolish comments or mistakes they've made. Others might point to Paul or one of the other well-known men or women featured in the scriptures. Me, I identify most with Jonah in the Old Testament. Now, Jonah made a lot of bad choices, and every opportunity he was given by God, Jonah went in the opposite direction. So it's easy to see why I most identify with him, at least in my early years. And just like Jonah, God pursued me, even in my disobedience to him. When I was growing up, I was the oldest of three kids, and our mom would literally drag us to church. It never really had a lasting impact on my life, probably because of the churches we were taken to. My grandfather was a godly man, and I went to church with him sometimes. But all these experiences, well, they taught me Bible stories and songs, you know, the motions and the words. But my Christianity was only skin deep, I called it. I didn't have a meaningful relationship with God. I didn't really connect with him in my heart. But I'd heard many times that God loves us and God's always around and that he'd send his son Jesus. But that's as far as my understanding went for a long time. I would describe our home life as difficult. My parents had troubles and struggles for as long as I could remember. Financial problems, infidelity issues, alcohol addiction. This was just a way of life for us growing up. My father had trouble keeping a job, probably because of his drinking, and he was always bringing things home that he'd stolen. Mostly he was absent for long stretches, and I grew up thinking, I don't want to be like him. We were mostly latchkey kids. Because of trying to get work, our family moved around a lot. I calculated that I attended 14 different schools in 11 years of education. That added even more stress to our lives, and I never had time to fit into any group. In fact, the longest I'd spent in any one school was two years. And I spent many years being bullied because I was the outsider. It wasn't a stable home life for us either. My parents separated several times. They finally ended their marriage and divorce. But when they finally divorced, my father just left, and my mother could only afford a tiny apartment to share with my brother and sister. And by that time, I'd had enough. I was 16 and I thought, 
I am not going to go live in a tiny apartment with my mother. I just thought that would be too demeaning. I decided I wasn't going to live with either of them, so I dropped out of high school and I went to work full time. I lived on my own and I tried to find happiness at a job. But I wasn't happy. I got my GED, I took some college classes, but I was miserable inside. For so long, I tried to live a good life. I tried rejecting the life my father led, and I was frankly just tired of being good. I was a young adult by then, and I was angry that I'd never had any fun that he seemed to have. I never got drunk, I never used drugs, but being good wasn't making me happy either. I decided I'd try stealing a few things and see what it felt like. Surprisingly, it felt great. I got an adrenaline high from doing something bad, and I wanted more of that feeling. It was my own private drug addiction, really. My actions quickly escalated, and I worked my way up to robbery in no time at all. I I didn't even need the money I was taking. I was just doing it for the thrill and the adrenaline rush. By the time I was finally stopped, I had committed six robberies in six weeks. I didn't own a firearm, so I put my hand in my jacket pocket and I just announced, I have a gun and this is a robbery. I'd never been arrested before. I'd never even been in trouble with the law. But I had become blind to what I was doing. I didn't even believe that I was committing serious crimes, you know, for which there'd be serious consequences. Maybe part of me believed that if I ever got caught, they'd just slap my hand and say, don't ever do that again, and they'd let me go. Little did I know that I'd be facing 30 years in prison for my crime spree. Now, let me make it abundantly clear I am not blaming my parents. I take full responsibility for my actions. We didn't learn necessarily about consequences at home growing up, but bottom line, I wasn't ready for real life. Let me tell you about the day I was arrested. The details are sharp and vivid in my memory. It's like watching a movie in my head. Several minutes after driving away from my sixth robbery, A police car pulled up behind me and turned on his lights. It was a warm day and my driver's side window was rolled all the way down. I pulled over not knowing what to expect. The officer jumped out of his car and ran toward my open window with his gun drawn. He was only a few feet away and I remember looking at the barrel of his gun pointing right at me. And he was yelling something, but I couldn't hear what he was saying. In those few seconds, it was like time had slowed down for me. I remember those seconds, those microseconds, if you will, even more vividly, because there was a debate going on in my head, and it went like this. A voice or a thought came to me and said, you know, if you pretend to have a gun, you can end this right now. Just make a sudden move and he won't miss, and all these problems will go away. There won't be any consequences. You won't have to face anyone. Your problems will be over. Well, I didn't know it then, but today they call that suicide by cop. And it's terribly destructive to the officer doing the shooting and to the victim's family members. But I wasn't thinking about him or anyone else. In those microseconds, I was seriously considering ending my life right then. But in those same microseconds, I felt like God was trying to say something to me. He was saying, don't do it. Don't take your life. I want you to quit running. I want you to surrender, not just to this officer, but I want you to surrender your life to me. And that's what I did. And it broke me. I remember being arrested that day and weeping. I wept for days in a jail cell. That is not an exaggeration. I I wasn't upset that I'd been caught. I was weeping because I had finally hit bottom 
I reached the end of myself and I knew that God and only God could repair my situation. I also knew that I didn't deserve to be repaired or rescued and I didn't expect it, believe it or not. But I basically said, God, I'm at your mercy. Whatever happens, I'll accept it. Jason, the days and the weeks and months that followed were really tough. The friends I thought I had left me. Some family members criticized me and didn't want to be associated with me. That was really painful. But a few Christians I knew stood by me. They didn't understand my actions, but they didn't abandon me either. When it came time to go to court months later, I told my lawyer that I just wanted to confess my crimes and throw myself at the mercy of the court. I felt like that was the honorable thing to do even in the dishonorable situation I found myself in. I didn't want to contest anything or deny anything. I just wanted to accept my punishment and serve my time in prison. So I admitted to six felonies and the judge could have given me 30 years in prison. But he showed mercy and sentenced me to two years in state prison. Now those were probably the most difficult and challenging years of my life. But God never left me. He stood by me. He protected me. He sent other believers to me along the way. Christians, some were inmates, some were guards, some were volunteers. Just periodically they would come to me and encourage me when I needed it. They prayed with me, they prayed for me. They reminded me that God was in control. And I couldn't always see it at the time, but I simply decided to trust him. I read the Bible and began to grow in my faith. I didn't know about the future. I didn't know what I was going to do when I got out. I just stayed focused on trusting God. I figured he could work out the details if he cared about my life. And he did. Eventually, I had a great job, a young family. My wife and I had children. And I knew that God wanted our kids to grow up in a godly home. He had poured his grace, love, and forgiveness into my life, even though I had nearly thrown it all away. And suddenly I felt blessed by the life I didn't deserve and never knew that I could have. And then one day I saw an article in a newspaper talking about volunteers working in the local county jail. And I knew right then that I wanted to serve. I desired to serve God, but I felt I could never be a pastor or a missionary. See, I figured I was damaged goods and I'd never be able to serve him in a ministry role. But I knew I could walk into a jail and offer encouragement and hope. I'd been out of prison for a few years and the prospect of going back inside, even a local jail, was a little daunting, a little frightening. I'm not going to lie to you. You never really forget what life is like in prison. How those bars closing and clanging behind you are loud enough to shake you to your bones. But I felt God calling me to serve this way, and I knew I could trust him. So I called the volunteer coordinator featured in the newspaper, and I went to meet her, and I told her my story. And I was completely upfront with her. <laughs> she said she appreciated my offer. She took my application, but... It was really unlikely I'd be allowed to help. The chief, her boss, had never allowed an ex-con to come inside his jail and work as a volunteer. It was just unheard of. But a few days later, she called me and said he'd approved it and I could start right away. I think she was more surprised than I was. She asked me then to make a six-month commitment to serve there. And that really made me pause. I wasn't sure how I was going to react to being behind bars again, even though I could leave whenever I wanted. I was concerned about hearing the sounds and clanging bars of incarceration. But I agreed, and I ended up serving with joy. And it felt good to be trusted again by cops and guards. And God had worked out the details so that I could serve him there. Well, one day she came to me and thanked me for serving for four years as a faithful volunteer. <laughs> I could not believe that much time had gone by. I was shocked. 
I had wanted to give back to God something as a thank you for the many believers he'd sent my way during my imprisonment. And I realized that I ended up giving back twice as much as he'd required of me the first time, and that serving him was easy and joyful. So my time was done serving in the jail, and I decided to look for a new volunteering opportunity. Well, a friend told me about a local Christian radio station that was using volunteers to serve as on-air hosts. And she said, you have a great voice. You should be in radio. So I began volunteering. First weekends, then overnights, then weekday mornings, and I absolutely loved it. I even went back to school part-time. I studied radio, and I knew that I'd found something that I loved and loved to do. I was hired as the station's program director. Then later, I had my own talk show on a Christian station across town. And it dawned on me, I'm serving God in my career. (laughs) I mean, I knew pastors who had congregations of a few hundred or even a few thousand people. But I was talking to tens of thousands of people every day about God and about his love and grace in my life. And even though I had considered myself damaged goods, God used my talents and my desires and allowed me to serve him in a way I had never dreamed possible. I later became the director of national news and public affairs for the largest Christian radio network in the country. I went on to accept the role of executive director for a national radio program. Today, I host mornings on a Christian station heard throughout Southern California. I look back and I see God's hand every step of the way. I've been in Christian radio now for over 25 years, and it's the best job I've ever had. Today, our kids are adults, and they have lives and families of their own. We have two wonderful grandchildren, and two more are on the way. I am living an abundant life, and I have that because Jesus came into my heart and asked me to trust him. And by faith, I surrendered to him. And he has directed my path and made it straight. Now listen, I've made mistakes along the way. I'll be the first to tell you that I'm not a perfect person. But I am a man who has been forgiven by God and he gets all the credit and the glory for any good that came out of my life. I'd like to also say this, If you're listening to my story, and maybe you can relate in some way, maybe you feel like Jonah running away from God, or maybe you've made mistakes, maybe you feel like damaged goods, and that God can't possibly turn your life around. I'm here to tell you that he can. He can do a miracle in your life too. Don't throw your life away like I was tempted to do. Surrender to him today, and he will bless you more than you will ever dream possible. Thank you, Jerry, for reminding us that we are not damaged goods and that God can still work in and through us. Learn more about Jerry at ksdwradio.com. Tales of the Revolution with Jason Vreeke continues... Damaged Goods is the name of the episode. Sometimes we feel damaged because of the actions we take or situations we go through. But sometimes we can feel damaged literally, perhaps when ravaged by an illness. My next guest storyteller is Pastor Dave Annan. He is the children's pastor at Community Bible Church in High Point, North Carolina. And while his main calling is to help our most precious citizens, children, learn about the real Jesus of Nazareth, he now has another calling, one that allows him to minister to people who hear the words they never want their doctor to say. And I'll let him tell you more. My name is Dave Annan, and uh, I have the privilege of knowing Jesus as my Savior, and I also have the privilege of being in the ministry. Uh, I've pastored for 38 years, been in the ministry for 38 years, and um, have served as senior pastor and children's pastor and 
assistant, and youth pastor. And you know, some of the things that uh, we go through, there's always spiritual battles that we face. Uh, when you're in God's army and you're in the trenches, um, there's always a target on your back. In 2013, um, something came to me that was a, a major challenge. Uh, I loved mission work. Matter of fact, uh, been to Japan, Guatemala, Jamaica, Peru, and Africa twice. And the second time I came back uh, from Africa, I had a lump on the top of my head and I, and I was a little bit concerned about it and thought, well, I need to probably get that checked out. Anyway, I came back from Africa, 2013. God did amazing things, absolutely. Matter of fact, we were even able to bring over uh, a couple of uh, African children to their biological mother here. I mean, it's just amazing what God did. Stepped off the plane, got busy, but I, I felt this lump on the top of my head. And so I decided that, uh, you know, I need to go to a dermatologist. So I went to the dermatologist and uh, she called me back in three days and said, uh, are you doing anything this week? And I said, well, I, I'm busy, but what do I need to do? And she said, you need to get down to Duke University you have stage 3B melanoma. Well, obviously, when you hear cancer, I have been on the side of going into the hospital and going into cancer wards and praying with people who had cancer. And I've seen the devastation of cancer. Both my wife, wife's father and mother both passed away from cancer. So. Cancer has been one of those things, it touches one out of three families. I mean, it's just a very unfortunate common kind of disease that is out there. But why would God allow me to have it all of a sudden? Well, what took place was I had major surgery. Uh, they took the tumor off of the back of my head, did a skin graft from my leg to uh, replace the skin on the back of my head. Uh, took my lymph nodes out, and it was pretty major surgery. But after some consultation, they said that uh, melanoma is a very deadly kind of cancer that kind of hides in your blood, and if there were any studies that I could get into, that I ought to do it. Well, I got into one study at uh, Baptist Wake Forest Baptist Hospital here locally, and uh, that really devastated me. Um, I had some severe side effects but then started to feel better and it came back to my lungs. So presently, as I, as I share this recording, I have stage four melanoma. It traveled from the back of my scalp down into my lungs, but I'm taking now a medicine called Keytruda that seems to be working currently. So I'm in a season of, of good health right now, which I thank God for. And that kind of brings me to the to meat of, of what I wanted to share and that is I wanted to share somehow this journey that I've been on since 2013. I've been on this cancer journey and uh, it has been tough. I, there have been nights where I went to bed and Satan would give me all kinds of thoughts of fear. I'd have to you know, quote scriptures. I, I've had severe physical pain, fatigue. Uh, had radiation through this process, it was confused, couldn't do the ministry. There were some real physical challenges and the thing that it, I realized is that yes, you can be a pastor, you can know the Word of God, but I was having to dig down into the depths of Scripture and, and hold on to my rock who is Jesus. I, I had to literally pray for God's grace to be poured out over over my heart and mind at times because of all the devastating aspects of cancer. Recently, I came across an idea, and what I've used as a model for my, my cancer in, as far as the scripture is that there's a story in the Old Testament of David and Goliath. Well, in this situation, Goliath is my cancer, and the stone would be anything that I could throw at my cancer. David, of course, had five smooth stones. He picked up that smooth stone. He slung the sling and the rock went to Goliath's forehead directed by God and Goliath fell. 
So I've, I've looked for something. What, what is the stone, God, that you want me to, to use? And again, there's lots of things. I mean, but I specifically am using a medicine called Keytruda uh, that God brought to my attention, and it seems to be working. Uh, so I'm thankful for that. But ultimately, it's Jesus. Ultimately, my stone that I'm throwing is God and his power and his ability to heal me. And so um, not too long ago, I uh, had an idea and I have a, a little burlap kind of bag and I wrote my testimony out on a piece of paper, front and back, single spaced, that shares my cancer journey and shows and shares that Jesus is the ultimate stone because he's called the living stone in the scriptures. He's called the cornerstone. And, and God brought me to that place to, uh, for me to realize that no matter what kind of stone I throw at him, Jesus is the stone. He's the one that brings down the enemy. So I carry around in my pocket a burlap bag, a half a piece of paper, a half sheet of paper with my testimony on it. And then I also put a stone in it with a cross on it. And God has helped me in this, and I finally have something tangible where, whether it's the McDonald's window, whether it's at Baptist Hospital, no matter where I go, uh, I always carry this little burlap bag, and, and God always brings someone to me that I can say, hey, this is what Jesus has done for me. This is uh, my testimony of God's grace and help uh, in my life. Recently, I went into a nursing home and I went to, to visit a member of our church. And as I'm sitting there ministering to the member of our church, a nurse walks in. And as the nurse begins to speak, I introduced myself. I said, I'm a pastor. And she was speaking, and she, the more she was there, she opened up and she shared that she had a mass on her liver that she was going to have a, an MRI for that coming Friday. And so I said, do you mind if I pray for you? And she said, no, not at all. So I prayed for her and I prayed in Jesus' name that uh, God would help her and encourage her. And the, the more I talked to her, she opened up and she was born in India. I don't know her background, but I'm assuming that it's probably Hindu or something of that, that nature. And so sure enough, I had that bag that I mentioned with my testimony and the rock in the back of my pocket. I was going to give it to the church member <laughs> just as an encouragement. But I was able to give it to this nurse and say, Jesus is the answer to eternal life and Jesus will walk through us in every valley. Uh, he's our best friend. And so I was able to give that little item to that nurse. I haven't heard how she's doing, but I've been praying for her. And so I'm thankful today that I have something tangible that at the drop of a dime, so to speak, and in an instantaneous moment, as God brings somebody to my heart, that I can share the, my testimony of salvation and how Jesus is walking and, and helping me through my battle with cancer, that I can pull this item out and hand it to them and say, read this. I also have my email on it, so that way if they have any questions, uh, they can respond to me. So I just thank God today that uh, I'm on the journey that God has placed me on. I'm battling cancer, and Jesus is my rock. And by the grace of God today, I know that Jesus has a plan. And ultimately, if he does not heal me on this earth, I'll have the ultimate healing. I'll see him face to face and be in his visible presence someday and never, ever have to face cancer again. So either way, we win. Thank you, Pastor Dave. You are an inspiration to me. To find out more about Pastor Dave Annan, check out cbchurch.org or the link in the show notes to his blog concerning his cancer journey. As the Damaged Goods episode continues, I feel urged to share something with you. I meet too many people who think they're not good enough to come to Jesus. It saddens me, and when I hear of people telling others that they need to clean themselves up before coming to Jesus, it sickens me. Hear me. We are unable to clean ourselves up. 
We need to come to Jesus just as we are. He is the one who does the cleanup. And surely, we're a lot more messed up than we realize. We're told in the ancient scriptures, the Bible, that we're not bad people in need of reform. We're dead people in need of resurrection. Right now, Jesus of Nazareth lives, and because he lives, we also shall live. Don't tell yourself you'll come to Jesus once you give up that sin or kick that habit. That day may never come. Instead, come to Jesus now, just as you are. He knows your struggles, and he knows you need him. Only He can help you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've been involved with. He will take you in with open arms. Place your faith in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Only He can save you from what you have done or from what has been done to you. He allowed Himself to be nailed to a cross. On that cross... He gave his own life as the worthy sacrifice to redeem the human race. Then, miraculously, on the third day, he rose from the dead. When people went to the tomb on that fateful Sunday, he was not there. Jesus is alive, and he's interested in you. He wants a relationship with you. I suggest you call him on it. The truth is that without him, us humans are unfortunately headed to a place called hell. What that means is eternal separation from God. Remember, God is the source of all goodness, love, and even light. Imagine an eternal sensory existence without these things. Imagine no goodness, no love, and no light. Instead, you have to deal with their absence. Fear, torment, hatred, pain, and darkness. Recorded for us in the Bible is a description that includes weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It is a place of outer darkness where the torture never ends. But that's why Jesus died on the cross so you wouldn't have to go to this place. And he rose from the dead to demonstrate his power over death and eternity. Choose to follow him and he will lead you. He doesn't promise a pain-free life, but he does promise eternal life for all those who call upon his name. Eternal life in his presence, experiencing all the goodness and all the pleasures that God has to offer. Please don't delay. Call upon Jesus now. Well, all right. The show's over for this time. But as always, there are more stories waiting for you at talesoftherevolution.com. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to email updates. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, or anywhere you find podcasts. And remember to follow us on social media, facebook.com slash tales of the revolution on Instagram at real Jason Vreeke and on Twitter at Jason Vreeke. That's V as in victory, R E E K E. If you need to catch up on any of the episodes, you can download them directly at tales of the revolution.com. Thank you so much for listening. These have been tales of the revolution with Jason Vreeke. This episode is entitled Damaged Goods. Now join me if you will and tell someone about Jesus of Nazareth as you live the revolution.